Hey everyone, I'm your host Anthony. We do content like this weekly, so hit the subscribe button and ring the bell to get notified. If you want more content like this, click the like button and please leave a comment. Thanks again for watching. Hey everyone and welcome to our live class. We're so excited to have you here today and looking forward to a great lecture. My name is Anthony and I'll be your host. I'm joined on the line by Dale White, clinical consultant at Quicksilver Scientific, who will be conducting most of the presentation today. I'm going to pass it off to him momentarily to kick off today's presentation with the topic of the Quicksilver Mercury Tri-Test Concepts and Interpretation. So I'm very excited about this. I think we all are. This is going to be a great presentation. I'd like to go over just a couple housekeeping items before we begin. I've muted everyone by default. And number two, if you have any questions during the course of this live class, please submit them into the chat panel. The questions will come to me as the host, and I'll be conducting a live question and answer with Dale at the end of today's presentation. And lastly, we'll be hosting a live demonstration at the end of today's live class with our head of practitioner partnerships, Adrian Martinez. So for those of you who are new to Rupa Health, feel free to stick around if you'd like to learn a little bit more about how we can help you optimize your practice. And for those of you who already use us, thank you so much. And if you need to get back to your practice or your day, feel free to hop off. So now I'd like to hand it off to Dale to begin the presentation. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for attending. My name is Dale White. I've been a clinical consultant with Quicksilver Scientific since 2015. And I'm going to do my best to live up to Anthony's promise of making this an exciting presentation. But some of the material may be a little bit dry. Uh, but anyway, there's Qu uh, Quicksilver Scientific logo. And we are going to talk about the Mercury the Quicksilver Scientific Mercury Tri-Test. Quicksilver has two different uh, tests, but we're gonna talk today only about the Mercury Tri-Test, which is patented. So some of the stuff I'm, I'm just gonna read uh, from my notes, but most of it'll be kind of conversational. So Quicksilver Scientific is the only laboratory in the world to offer mercury speciation analysis. Why is this important? Mercury exists in the human body in two different forms, inorganic and methylmercury, or also called uh, organic mercury because of that. Methyl group is an organic group. Those forms come from two different sources, primarily amalgam and um, dietary sources. They have two different relative toxicities and they are excreted through two different primary organs, the liver and kidneys. Utilizing advanced mercury speciation analysis, the patented mercury tri-test is the only test that separates and quantifies the concentrations of each form of mercury in the blood, as well as the excretion products in the urine and hair. The sensitivity of Quicksilver instrumentation eliminates the need for challenge testing and potentially provocative chelating substances. So we speciate the two different forms. So we separate the methyl and the inorganic. We look at the hair, the concentration of methyl mercury in the hair and the concentration of inorganic mercury in the urine. When the concentration in the blood and the concentration being excreted is known, the practitioner is able to evaluate the patient's ability to excrete the different forms of mercury compared to an ideal. With this level of detailed information, the practitioner can identify and eliminate the source of toxicity and compensate for patients with poor excretion. Consistently successful protocols can be created and exacerbations can be avoided. So this is a slide for people who are a lot smarter than me. Uh, Quicksilver measures both methyl and inorganic mercury directly via liquid chromatography coupled to cold vapor atomic fluorescence spectrometry. So here's an outline. Um, so let's just dive in. So first we're gonna take a, an orientation, little uh, 
tour around the Mercury Tri-Test. So the, the results will come back like this, two pages. The first page will present the results and the second page has some discussion. So, so please read that second page, uh, you know, over the first few that you get, it will help explain some things and make it uh, clearer, but the results are actually presented on page one. So here's page one, and we're gonna go into all these different components um, and what they mean and what information you can derive from them. So first we're gonna look at only the blood results. The top half of page one is the blood results only. And uh, it'll look like this. You'll have three color bar graphs and the table. The numerical results are presented in the table. And then the three colored bar graphs above that are a graphic representation of the numerical results. And the colored bar graphs break it into percentiles. So it can make it quick and easy to read. When you're looking at this, the gray bar represents the Quicksilver average. And uh, on the right-hand side, you'll see that little box, the legend, if you forget which color bar means what, you can reference the legend and that will uh, tell you. So the uh, gray bar is the average, and then you can see the numerical averages in the table. The white bar, which you see only in the bottom colored bar graph, that's the CDC average. So the CDC average and the Quicksilver average are gonna be different because the Quicksilver average is derived from data collected at Quicksilver because Quicksilver is the only lab that can collect that data, right? So uh, Quicksilver has a different average than the national average. When you're looking at a uh, result here, the dark blue bar represents the current result, the current patient's, the patient's current results. And you'll see that in the table uh, on the left side. The gold bar represents the, let's see, yeah, the gold bar represents the prior result. And then in, you can see that the prior result is represented in the table in the middle column. And then on the right, there will be a percent change. One thing to note here, take a look at the, the top two colored bar graphs, the methylmercury, MEHG, and the middle, the inorganic mercury, HG2. Notice that the colored zones, which represent the percentiles, those are those relatively line up, so they're relatively similar. However, take a look at the actual concentrations. Look at the scale. Notice that the methylmercury in this uh, example is zero to eight, whereas the inorganic mercury is zero to five. So the actual concentrations can be very different and we'll go into that in, uh, in a moment. Okay, when you're looking at this top half of the results, this is where you'll find the methylmercury, the top row of the table and the top colored bar graph. This is where you'll find the values for the inorganic mercury, the middle colored, colored bar graph and the middle row of the table. And this is where you will find the total mercury in the blood. So Quicksilver speciates the forms of mercury, methyl and inorganic, and then adds those together to create that bottom row, the sum mercury total. Let's go back here a second. So the mercury total, so when you're looking at the mercury total over here on this bottom color bar graph, that's something that you would get from a LabCorp or Quest test. So if you just have the uh, total mercury 
uh, from a blood draw, it would be equivalent to that mercury total. Here, uh, this is where you will see the reference ranges and the percentiles uh, on the front page in that table. So, um, so you can see those highlighted in red. The reference values for methyl and inorganic mercury reflect patient data generated at Quicksilver Scientific. Reference values for total mercury are provided by the CDC. And when you look at those averages, you can see the averages are different, very different for the two different species and for the total from the CDC. Then these percentiles, so you can see this, this column, 50th percentile column, 75th, 90th, 95th. So these are represented by different colors. And we'll see that in a moment here. So here um, are the two different, uh, are, these are the different percentiles. So the right-hand end of each colored zone represents that percentile. So for example, and I didn't include the inorganic mercury just so I could make these uh, graphics bigger. But notice the gray bar here for methylmercury is between the 50th and 75th percentile. So that's somewhere maybe around the 60th percentile. So you can estimate that in terms of percentile. And look at the difference here in the, uh, how the percentiles are ranked between methyl mercury and total mercury, and it'd be similar in the inorganic mercury. So the CDC, the CDC establishes 4.6 as the 95th percentile in normal adults, whereas Quicksilver establishes the 95th percentile for methyl mercury in normal adults as 7.4. So there'll be these um, different percentiles. So on page two, when you get your results, you see on page two, you'll see this graphic. Uh, and this is one way to think about uh, relative toxicity of each form. Uh, the green zone up to the 50th percentile being low to normal, yellow mild elevation, tan, moderate, pink, moderate to severe, and red, severe. That's one way to think about it, but we're gonna go into a little more detail. Um, and I'm gonna suggest, so when you're first starting, you can use that uh, for quick and easy. Uh, and, but we'll look at that in a little more detail in a few more slides. Okay, the urine and hair results. So the urine and hair results are located in the small table in the lower right-hand corner of page one. And you'll see, of course, on the left-hand side, the left-hand column, the methyl, inorganic, and total mercury. The middle column has the urine results, and the urine results are divided into three sub-columns. On the left will be the results from the current test, in the middle from a prior and then the percent change. And then in the, the hair results are presented only as total mercury. So the, what you see in the hair is almost exclusively uh, methyl mercury. So the inorganic mercury content is, is insignificant. So the methyl and total mercury values are considered to be identical and speciation analysis is not necessary for the hair sample. So here, let's look at the methyl mercury toxicity, go into that in a little more specificity. So methyl mercury comes from a dietary source, sorry, <clears throat> fish and seafood. It's about, 90, we have about 95% uptake. 
So these, this is a little more specific way to think about relative toxicity of methyl mercury. So that top one we see expected. You see the dark blue bar in, a, in about the middle of the green zone. So we do expect to see some mercury of both types really. Right now we're just talking about methyl, but we do expect to see some small amount of mercury in circulation, which means it's available to be excreted, in this case through the liver. So um, we would consider that to be expected. Now for methyl mercury, it might not become, it might not be a problem for a particular patient. For most patients, it's not going to be a problem until it gets up to around three. Uh, when it starts exceeding three, then we want to be looking at their history and thinking about bringing that down, counseling them regarding their uh, fish and seafood consumption. When it extends further up into the tan zone, considering that a mild to moderate toxicity, when it gets into the pink zone, a moderate to severe toxicity. And as soon as it gets into that red zone above the 95th percentile, then that's considered a severe toxicity. It doesn't have to be as high as you see it in this particular example up around 14, even if it's down here around eight, as long as it gets into that red zone, we're gonna consider that a severe toxicity. Inorganic mercury. So inorganic mercury uh, comes from mercury vapor. And the primary source of that uh, for humans is amalgam fillings. Um, mercury has a high vapor pressure, it's always gassing off. We breathe it in, we absorb it through the lungs into the blood where it's converted to the uh, inorganic form. So here, it, it's kind of similar with regard to percentiles as a methyl mercury. Uh, again, we expect to see some inorganic mercury present in the blood. So it's, it's in circulation, it can be excreted. However, a borderline to mild, we, we don't wanna see that inorganic mercury extending much past that quicksilver average, that gray bar. And then again, look at the scale. So this is a really actual low concentration of inorganic mercury, especially compared to the um, concentrations you'll see with methyl. And then moderate, again, tan zone, moderate to severe pink, severe red. So there again, between expected and borderline to mild, kind of a gray area where you'll think about the condition of your client, uh, their resiliency, uh, how vulnerable they are. And then between expected and borderline mild, maybe a problem for them, maybe not. So let's look at excretion. This is where perhaps it gets exciting. Um, so these are the excretion pathways. Inorganic mercury is excreted through the urine, process, uh, filtered out through the kidneys and excreted in through the urine. The liver excretes methyl mercury, which goes out through the stool. So on the bottom half of the first page, just below the table, you will see these red and white graphs, the excretion graphs. On the left, urine results. On the uh, right, the hair results. So on the left, we're looking at kidney excretion. On the right, we are looking at liver excretion. And the ratios, so you'll see that these graphs are scaled to uh, represent specific ratios, and those ratios are described in the legend. 
So what are we, when we look at these graphs, what are we talking about? What are we measuring? What are we thinking about? We're thinking about the excretion, the excretion ability of the liver and kidney. So excretion is a function of transporter dynamics. Metals are transported into and out of liver and kidney cells via transporter proteins, which are embedded in the cell membrane. The primary exporting proteins are called MRP2 or multi-drug resistant proteins. So here you can see MRP2 here and MRP2 here. So kidney, so this is a representation of a cell in the proximal tubule of the kidney. Toxins are exported in. In this case, we're talking about inorganic mercury and these thiol conjugates of inorganic mercury are then excreted through these MRP2 excretion proteins into the urine. And in a hepatocyte, the um, methylmercury is going to be imported, processed, and excreted through the MR, MRP2 protein into the bile caniculi. So when we're looking at these excretion graphs, that's what we're, th we're thinking about is the efficiency, the effectiveness of these transporter proteins. They're called MRP, which stands for multi-drug resistant protein. They were uh, discovered by pharmaceutical companies trying to figure out why some people resisted the action of their drugs. And in these people, these MRP proteins worked really well. So the drug would go in, but be excreted quickly. This is also the same mechanism through which some bacteria are able to develop resistance to some antibiotics. The antibiotics go in, the bacteria excrete them. So kidney excretion. So this is gonna, if you forget what it represents, just take a look at the graph. Up on the top, you see urine results. So obviously that means kidney. Uh, just below that, you see indication of inorganic mercury excretion ability. The kidneys excrete inorganic mercury. On the bottom, you see the blood values will be plotted horizontally. So the blood concentration of inorganic mercury is plotted on the horizontal axis. The value for the urine inorganic mercury is plotted on the vertical axis. And then the diagonal line represents ideal excretion. So we want to see this square dot fall on or above that diagonal black line. So here you can, we're putting the uh, putting it together. So you see the blood. You take the blood inorganic mercury value of zero point four five, plot it on the horizontal axis. You take the urine value of three point one zero, plot it on the vertical axis. And that's where you plot the dot. So if you, you know, if you ever need to, you know, sometimes it's fun, or some people like to calculate a percent excretion, um, and you can do that. Just take the urine value, take the urine value as your numerator, take the blood value as your denominator, calculate that, and then multiply it times a hundred, and you've got your percent excretion. So there's the urine value, 3.10. There's the blood value, 0 0.45. So what we're doing here is we're, the, we're taking the, the mercury's in the blood. Then it's being filtered out of the blood by the kidney and excreted in the urine. So what we're doing is evaluating the efficiency of the filter, which is the kidneys. 
So changes in urine value. So as the excretion concentration increases or decreases, the dot's gonna move up or down, right? So the excretion products, the urine, the more that's in the urine, the more that's being excreted, that dot is gonna move higher. If the excretion is low, uh, that dot is gonna move farther down. Okay, liver excretion. This is the same concept. Um, here on top, you see hair results. So obviously urine is a direct excretion product of the kidneys. And, um, but bile is the excretion product of the liver, but we can't so easily get a sample of bile. So in this case, we use um, hair as a surrogate for bile and it works pretty well. And we have some research uh, for this, but uh, we're gonna use the same concept, but hair is, um, you know, you take a urine sample that may represent two to six hours worth of excretion, whereas a hair sample could represent four to 12 weeks of excretion. So we give a little plus or minus when we're looking at this graph, we consider that that dot might be a little bit higher or a little bit lower. But um, again, if you forget what this is about, hair results are an indication of methylmercury excretion ability, blood value plotted horizontally, hair value plotted vertically. And the um, graph is scaled. Le that information's in the legend. So there's your blood value. There's your hair value. And the diagonal black line is going to represent the ideal excretion. The ratio is 375 to one hair to blood. Changes in blood value. So as exposures increase or decrease, blood levels will increase or decrease and the dot will move to the right or left. Excuse me a second, I'm gonna close this so we get a little less sun on me. There we go, oops. So this, this methylmercury excretion profile is gonna be sensitive to recent changes in fish and seafood consumption. A recent dietary exposure to fish and or seafood may cause the dot to move farther to the right so that's gonna make excretion appear lower than it really is. Conversely, if fish and seafood consumption was fairly consistent over the last few months, but se severely curtailed uh, in the weeks prior to the blood draw, the dot may move farther to the left relative to the hair value, since hair represents excretion over a longer period. So, we advise a patient not to eat any fish or seafood for three to four days prior to the blood draw to avoid artificially elevating those blood levels and also inquire about the patient's history of fish and seafood consumption over the last three months to see if they've made a, a big change. Important atypical examples. Okay, this is an example of a severe toxicity that would not be revealed on a typical blood test from LabCorp or Quest, or even for that matter, from a uh, Quicksilver blood metals panel, because all those panels are going to test total mercury. So if you performed this blood test and looked only at the total mercury, it would look excellent. So what you would get you would be seeing this bottom graph only. The bottom graph only, or here, this bottom row of the total mercury. So it'd look great, right? But it's obvious in this example that inorganic mercury is a moderate to severe toxicity. 
Um, so this is something you would miss. Um, here's another atypical result. So remember, we expect to see some mercury of both forms, both methyl and inorganic mercury. So if you ever get a test result like this, this is uh, a cellular sequestration. So the mercury is tightly bound in the cells. And usually it will be just one form or the other, but it could be both forms. So if you ever get a result back where one or both forms have no dark blue bar and the um, numerical values look quite low, like they're not registering, then that is often a problem with methylation. We see this time and again correlate with um, defects in their methylation. And uh, then you want to dig into their methylation to correct that, to open up those excretion pathways again. Um, we're going to just a couple of slides on the, on the blood metals panel. This is the Quicksilver Blood Metals panel. And in, in this panel, uh, mercury is represented by only total mercury. Um, you see there's eight different nutrient elements and eight different toxic elements. And then the whole blood element ratios between calcium, magnesium, and copper zinc. We'll go into that in more detail in a later webinar. So here's some case examples. Fifty six year old CEO, heavy fish consumption, had his amalgams removed, early onset dementia, fatty liver and insulin resistance, anxiety and racing mind, initially followed functional neurologist supplementation, Recommendations helped a little bit, but not very much. So um, here's the initial test results. You can see both methyl and inorganic mercury are severely elevated. Here's the excretion results. So significant retention and poor kidney clearance of inorganic mercury. When you see a result like this where the uh, kidney excretion is suppressed, then that we call that a retention toxicity. They are retaining the mercury in their tissues. They're not excreting it. They're not keeping up. The excretion is not keeping up with the uh, input. Output is not equivalent to input. And here on the right, you see poor bile clearance of methylmercury. So same thing, they're not keeping up. They're putting it in faster than they can get rid of it. So here's a follow-up test. You can see gold bar is the prior result. The dark blue bar is the uh, current result. So it came down from severe toxicity down to a uh, moderate. Here's the excretion. So you can see the kidney clearance of inorganic mercury was restored and uh, proper bile clearance of methylmercury was restored. Summary, 91% drop in methylmercury, 80% drop in inorganic, excretion markers corrected, um, neuro symptoms improved, liver and blood sugar markers normalized. Case two, healthy 56-year-old man, heavy fish consumption, fatigue, brain fog, memory, um, unusual symptoms for an otherwise high energy person, public speaker, author, life coach, philanthropist. Massive mercury levels, uh, very severe toxicity. Here's the excretion. 
you can see the uh, impaired kidney clearance of inorganic mercury. That's pretty low. Uh, you don't often see it that compromised. Poor bile clearance of methyl mercury. Here's the first follow-up tri test. Methylmercury coming down fast. Inorganic mercury increased. So what's going on? You can see that the kidney needs more support. So you can see from the previous excretion graph that the kidney excretion actually uh, declined, whereas the bile clearance of methylmercury improved a lot. So some uh, uh, kidney support was added, and then you see both methyl and inorganic mercury drop. Then you see the liver clearance actually improve, improved more and the kidney and clearance, the kidney and clearance, the kidney clearance improved, but it still uh, needs support, still has a ways to go. Case two summary, both forms came down quickly, brain issues resolved, lower back pain resolved. So lower back pain is a, is a clue that uh, the kidney clearance is impaired energy resolved, um, last reported test was nine parts per billion down from 120, but still a ways to go. So now you get to practice. So let's take a look at this case. What do you see? Patient has symptoms of fatigue, Hashimoto's, low morning cortisol, they have an all organic diet, they do eat fish and seafood, their amalgams were removed 23 years ago, they have difficulty losing weight. So what do you see? What do you think is going on? Take a quick look. So we see methylmercury is severely elevated. That's due to their consumption of fish and seafood. And you see um, on the right-hand side, so over, over here, you see retention of methylmercury. So they're putting it in with the seafood, fish and seafood, and they're not getting it out with the compromised liver excretion. Inorganic mercury. So their amalgams were removed 23 years ago. So where is the inorganic mercury coming from? Where, what's the source of this? The source of this inorganic mercury is twofold. One we can see right away is the poor kidney excretion. So they're retaining it. They're not excreting it quickly enough. The other um, source is from methylmercury. So when methylmercury gets up into this pink and red zone and even lower concentrations for some people, <clears throat> that methylmercury, when it's high and concentrated highly enough can demethylate. The, um, it'll drop that methyl group and those two mercuries will combine uh, bind to each other to form inorganic mercury. So high elevations of methylmercury is a secondary source of inorganic mercury. So that, that's that inorganic mercury coming from demethylation of inorganic mercury and the retention. So that demethylation of methylmercury, that different people will do that at different rates. So there can, for some people, it may take fairly high concentrations. For some people, uh, it may not take very high 
uh, concentrations and so people do it at different rates also. Okay, case B, what do you see here? There is fish and seafood consumption and there are two small amalgams. So methylmercury is elevated due to the diet. The liver excretion is good. The inorganic mercury is elevated due to the exposure from the amalgams and the retention. So exposure from amalgams and the retention toxicity from poor excretion and demethylation of elevated methylmercury. Okay, C, amalgams removed 11 years ago. They are a pescatarian of good fish. So what's happening here? The methylmercury is borderline and the liver excretion is near ideal. So I would not necessarily consider that, uh, I would not consider this uh, liver excretion graph a problem uh, unless they had symptoms that correlated to liver issue. Um, so we see poor kidney excretion, we see borderline, um, methylmercury, we see moderate to severe inorganic mercury. So the amalgams were removed 11 years ago. We would expect that the inorganic mercury would have been excreted by now. Where's the inorganic coming from? <clears throat> Again, it's from kidney excretion being severely depressed. And this is interesting in that what's happening with this person is they're eating fish and seafood. So when they eat that, they get a spike in the methylmercury. So what's happening for them is their liver excretion is pretty good. But when they eat the fish, the methylmercury will spike up into this pink and red zones. And when it does, some of that will demethylate and convert to inorganic mercury. Then their liver excretion is good so that then the methylmercury drops down, but their kidney excretion is very poor. So the methylmercury that converts to the inorganic is not excreted and they end up retaining this inorganic mercury. So it's the inorganic mercury is primarily coming from the spikes in methyl, demethylating and then not being excreted. Okay, case D, no fish consumption. Amalgams removed decades ago. They've been chronically ill for decades. Name a symptom, they have it. So what's happening here? Why? Are there no dots on the excretion graphs? It looks like mercury is not an issue, right? Methylation problem, poor excretion. So you won't run into this kind of case very often, but it's good to know about. The uh, urine and hair excretion products of the blood and there are no dots on the excretion graphs because there's not enough mercury present in the blood to show up in an excretion product in significant enough concentrations to be measured. We cannot tell necessarily from this result if, um, if the mercury itself is a significant issue or not. The big issue is methylation. And that's important to identify as it can inhibit the excretion of many kinds of toxins, not just mercury. Um, 
as well as other kinds of implications. So you want to correlate this with signs and symptoms, other tests, other test results to uh, identify if it's a methylation problem. And then once the methylation is corrected, you may want to redo the tri-test to see if then you start to see um, start to see significant concentrations of mercury being excreted. So questions and answers, questions and hopefully answers. Hey Dale, thank you so much for doing that presentation. It was so informative. Really, I loved how you went in depth. Uh, on the understanding of this mercury tri test and the differences in the blood, the hair, the urine analysis for the practitioner. So super informative. Thank you again. So yes, it's time for the question and answer. And we did receive some questions. So let's just jump right in. And so I have the first question, which is why not start with ordering the blood metals panel if mercury is high, then order the mercury tri test after that? That's a totally valid way to go if you want to. So remember the, um, the risk factors are gonna be for methylmercury, um, fish and seafood consumption. Uh, and if they're eating a lot of fish and seafood, then the methylmercury can convert to the inorganic mercury. So the risk factors for inorganic mercury, the primary reason to do the mercury tri-test is so you can see the, you can exceed the excretion of liver and kidney, and you can identify the concentrations of the two different forms. Risk factor for methylmercury, fish and seafood consumption. Risk factor for inorganic mercury is uh, amalgams or high concentrations of methylmercury. And uh, so starting with just a, if they have no amalgams and you want to start with just the blood metals panel you can do that it might save them some money and if if it comes back you know mild moderate then maybe skip the tri test if it comes back elevated <clears throat> or if they're eating a lot of fish or seafood or have amalgams then you want to get uh, a look at that inorganic mercury to make sure they uh don't have a severe elevation of the inorganic or if there's a problem with excretion. Typically, what I will often do when uh, pocketbook stress is an issue for the client, I will tell them uh, I'll draw two vials of blood. For blood metals panel, you only need one vial, but I'll usually go ahead and draw both vials, send both vials in because Quicksilver will save those then I have them take their urine and hair samples and keep those. And if, the, if their blood metals mercury comes back elevated, then go ahead and send, then request Quicksilver to run the tri test also. And you've already got your hair and urine samples from the date of the blood draw. And then you can get the combo um, test price, which is a little cheaper. Amazing. Thank you for answering that. Good information to know, Dale. Thank you. Question number two is, will, organ will inorganic mercury be high if my patient does not have amalgams? Yeah, we kind of covered that. Um, will depend on their fish and seafood consumption. So it could be they're in or if they have no amalgams, which we saw in a couple of cases there, um, but they are eating significant amounts of fish and seafood, then the, the methyl elevations in methylmercury could convert to inorganic. Good to know. Thank you for that response. All right. Question number three is what is the turnaround time of this test? About three to four weeks. Not too bad for a very important results. So thank you for that information as well. And then question number four is when should the patient retest? So that's going to depend on a few things. <clears throat> so 
Uh, it's going to depend on are they complying with the protocol? Uh, are they tolerating the protocol? What kind of doses are they getting up to? So if they have poor compliance or poor tolerance of the products, then that's going to reduce that's going to reduce their excretion, right? Is that they, we, you want to get them up into higher doses to really drive that excretion. So it's going to depend on how compliant they are. Are they reducing the input? Are they, um, they stop putting it in? Um, and are you facilitating taking it out? And how compliant, um, you know, sometimes they'll go on and off or they'll do low doses or so. In general, if they're pretty compliant, most people retest in three to four months, maybe six months. And you might choose in, in general, if you want to compare apples to apples, the original test would usually be just an ambient blood test. If you want to get kind of get a view deeper into the tissues, you can retest them while they are on the protocol, while you have these um, metals mobilized. But most people will do a protocol, take their best guess as to when the patient's going to be done, take a three-week washout period, then retest. That's comparing apples to apples. Otherwise, you test them when they're mobilized, and you might see higher levels. So you want to tell, warn your patient about that. It just means you need to just keep going. Very interesting. Thank you for that thorough response, Dale. And question number five, last question for you here today. I know you've covered this in depth, so thank you so much for this, Dale. How does whole blood compare to urine or hair testing? So, so we saw that uh, in the urine, in with regard to mercury, if you just leave the kidneys alone, let them do their natural process, <clears throat> what you're going to see in the urine is inorganic mercury, um, very little uh, methyl mercury, almost exclusively inorganic, little to no methyl mercury. So in the urine, you're going to miss the methylmercury and methylmercury is the most dominant form of mercury in the blood. By far, you're going to have much higher concentrations of methylmercury in, uh, in the blood than you are inorganic. So you'd be better just to do a lab corp or a quest than you would do a straight uh, urine. Um, and then in terms of hair, um, it's the hair, you know, there's some problems with the hair that we talked about. It represents a, a longer period of excretion. Uh, we don't know <clears throat> what kind of uh, conditions the hair was subjected to. We don't know how long that piece of hair was that they submitted or how close they cut it to the scalp. So cutting it closer to the scalp, more recent exposure. Longer piece is going to have a, represent a longer term of exposure. And then we don't know what is it, uh, how their hair has been treated. So blood is the most reliable. Some people think that, just think of metals Metals are going to behave in our body just like they would in any other aqueous solution uh, separated by uh, compartments by membranes. And sorry if that sun is distracting. <clears throat> so the metals are, are dynamic. They're not static. They're going to move across membranes according to concentration gradients. They're going to tend to move from an area of higher concentration to an area of lower concentration until that gradient is uh, evened out. And so the, the most representative um, sample is gonna be the blood. 
Very fascinating, interesting. Dale, thank you so much for answering all of those questions. And I know we weren't able to get to everyone's question today, but please reach out to us after this live class if you still need help. So again, thank you for attending this live class. Huge shout out to Dale White and Quicksilver Laboratory. This was very interesting and just a very helpful presentation to understand the Quicksilver Mercury tri-test even further. So again, thank you, Dale. And we hope to see you all at the next live class. And before you leave, we have our head of practitioner partnerships, Adrian Martinez, and he's going to put on a live demo right now for all of you of Rupa Health. So if you'd like to learn more, please stick around. And Adrian, thank you so much for joining us. And I'm going to hand it off to you now. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Dr. Anthony. And thank you so much, Dale, for that amazing presentation. Very excited to be with you all today uh, and speak to and speak about Rupa Health, who we are as a platform, why we're here creating content such as this presentation with Dale. Um, so with that, let's jump right into it. First and foremost, thank you all for sticking around, those of you are, that are sticking around. Um, as Anthony mentioned, my name is Adrian Martinez. I'm the head of practitioner partnerships here at Rupa Health. And really what that means is if you've gotten an email from me before, you might be a good fit for using our platform, right? Um, so what we've done is we've created Rupa Health. And the reason we've done that is we really believe in the mission of making root cause medicine the standard of healthcare. Um, you know, at this time, when you think about the landscape of functional medicine and the testing that's involved with that, there's a lot of pain points that can be associated. Most practitioners are working with anywhere from three to six different labs at any given time. Um, and with that, they're presenting its own, you know, hurdles, right? How are you managing one, all these different logins for these accounts and having to create these different logins for these different accounts, because, you know, providing a, you know, full list and gambit of tests to your patients is important. Um, so what we've done is we've created a platform that's brought on 20 plus different labs, uh, allowing you as a practitioner to order from all of your labs in one place, of course, including Quicksilver. Beyond that, we've made managing all your results more accessible by bringing it all into one place. So from the practitioner standpoint in, in your staff, it's saving you time and energy of having to go to multiple places to place and track and manage all of your orders. When you think about the other side of things, the patient side, that tends to take up a lot of time as well, right? Um, the patients that are having these tests done most likely have seen traditional medicine doctors multiple, uh, you know, oftentimes. And so there's a lot of questions that can be uh, involved with these tests, right? A lot of handholding, and that can take up a lot of time for you and your staff as well, right? All the admin work associated and then the support side of things, um, you know, things like how are you coordinating phlebotomies? How are you making pricing transparent? Who's paying for the tests themselves? And these oftentimes very expensive cash pay tests. So all those pain points that can be associated with these tests and with the existing process, we've designed Rupa to help alleviate those. So with that, what you should now see is the dashboard. This is the Rupa Health dashboard. You go to rupahealth.com. It's a free account to sign up for and takes just a minute. Any test that you're able to order directly from the labs, you're gonna be able to order from Rupa as well. So what I wanna show you first and foremost is how easy it is to place an order on Rupa. So at the top where it says start order, this is one of the places where you'll actually be able to start an order. All we need are three bits of information to place that order. The patient's first name, last name, and email address. That's how simple it is to create a patient on Rupa Health and place that order. We collect everything else necessary to facilitate that order directly from the patient, right? The shipping address, the billing information, all that, we'll collect that. We make things as streamlined as possible for you to place this order. The first sets of tests that you'll see up here at the top are bundles. So we can actually create custom bundles as well on Rupa. So a custom bundle being a set of tests, a set of blood panels, a combo of tests and blood panels, whatever you want it to be. That way it's just one click and all of the tests that you're looking for are added into your cart. Below that, you can actually create a favorites list. So a favorites list being individual tests that you're commonly ordering. So you can put a little heart next to it. And that way, again, those will be among the first tests that you want to order. You don't have to search through the entire catalog. And up at the top here, we have the Quicksilver Mercury Tri Test that we were just speaking about, right? So again, it's all accessible. It's all super simple. And I can even order from, again, any of the labs that we're looking to work with, right? Just one click, it's added into the cart. If you're looking for a specific test, you have access, of course, to the entire catalog down below. So again, over 20 plus different labs, 
Um, and over 2000 different tests, you can run filters, you can run searches, whatever you need to do to find those tests all at your fingertips. Again, just one click that's added into your card over here on the right hand side. To make things even more streamlined for you, we're going to default these tests to be drop shipped directly to the patients, right? So those of you who are working in telehealth or those of you who probably don't want to stock a bunch of inventory in your office, in your clinics, you no longer have to do that. We're going to ship these kits directly to the patients. Um, on top of that, if there's any add-on tests available, we make that as simple as clicking this button here. It'll bring up all the details. And then from there, we can go ahead and click which add-ons we want. We offer the lowest possible practitioner prices, right? Pricing being something, of course, that is very important, not only to you as a practice, but to your patients, right? We won't want to upcharge our patients. And most practitioners that we work with don't charge the patients more uh, for these tests, right? So that's why we offer multiple different billing options. We'll invoice the patient directly for you, or you have the option of paying for the tests yourself and then billing the patient outside of Rupa. Either way, the prices are gonna remain the same. So your patients are gonna get that lowest possible cost, as well as you as a practitioner are gonna get that lowest possible cost. So you'll see here with that trimercury test, right? If you were to refer your patient, there would be a different cost. Through Rupa Health, it's 179, right? The way that we generate our revenue is very straightforward. So since we don't upcharge the cost of these tests at all, it's as simple as a 7% processing ordering fee, which is associated to the test. And that's paid for by whoever's paying for the test directly. So what that means is if you're paying for the test or rather having us invoice the patient directly for the tests, then you're not gonna pay anything to Rupa. As I mentioned, it's free to sign up for, free to use. That 7% is the only way that we go ahead and uh, make our revenue, right? So it's gonna be free for you to use. If you do decide to pay for the tests, you simply just click that box there and again, you can add your own billing information, but you would have to bill the patient outside of Rupa. I would say the majority of our patients or of our practitioners prefer to have us manage billing for a number of reasons. Um, but I would say the main reason one would just be something more off your plate, right? You don't have to manage that billing with the patient anymore. You can add notes for the patient. This can be anything. For example, if the patient is taking a supplement regimen, you can go ahead and do that um, and write those specific instructions for them there. Notes for Rupa. Again, this can be anything you want us to know. Uh, if there's a preferred method, for example, if you prefer to have your um, results faxed to you, we can go ahead and have those sent to you. Just let us know. And you can also add ICD-10 codes. So if the patient does want to submit a super bill to insurance after um, you know, they pay for their tests, they do have that option. You would just simply add an ICD-10 code in here. We'll send over a template to the patients, walking them through how to create that super bill and submit that to their insurance. So again, all the options taken care of for you, but if nothing else, you go ahead and send that to the patient and that's how easy it is to place an order on Rupa Health. Another quick call out here, which is an amazing feature is we can actually schedule orders as well. So if you are looking to test a patient down the line, we can automate that process for you, right? So if we know that we want to send an order to Chris, you know, December 21st, we can go ahead and schedule that. So leveraging the technology that we've created here, as opposed to you having to, you know, manually write something out, put it in your calendar, right? It's all taken care of for you here on Rupa Health. So another thing off your plate there. With that, within the main dashboard is where you're going to track all your orders, right? So we can hop in here. We can run and search for patients by name. We can filter by status of your order. So we will continually update the status of these orders throughout the entire process. And I can click into any of my orders at any time to get an idea of where they're currently standing, right? So this one, for example, is the invoice was paid on June 1st. Um, if I want to click into any of them, though, it should give me more indication as to where they're at, right? So I'll know when the sample arrived at the, at the lab um, and when I'm estimated to get those results in. I also have the option of ordering again. Once those results are in, you're sent an email notifying you that the results are in and you're able to click into the tab here and you'll be able to download the results. You can send them to the patient. You can schedule a clinical consult directly with the lab um, as well as even get an, a, a copy of that digital requisition. So all of these results are accessible within Rupa Health as opposed to traditionally getting them from every single portal and having to track and manage those and put them into an EHR, for example, or however you're managing them, even if it's like a spreadsheet, right? We'll simplify that process for you entirely. So those are the two main components in terms of Rupa Health when it comes to tracking and managing your lab work from a practitioner side. What I'm going to show you next is what the patient experience is. The patient experience is something that what I found can be overlooked sometimes in, in some practices, but it's so important, right? Because not only does it, you know, it's a patient that you should be caring about, right? But it also reflects directly upon your practice. So what do we do to ensure the patient is getting 
the service that patients and really just humans in general have come to expect in 2021, right? So this is what it looks like. Here's a timeline. As soon as you place an order, your patient will get communications from us, right? We'll notify that patient and those communications will vary whether you pay for it or the patient's paying for the test directly. We'll ship the kits out within 24 hours of receiving payment. So that's something to note as well as at Rupa, it's a little different than some labs. We won't ship those tests out until the, the patient pays for the tests or rather the tests are paid for. And then we'll send over our own curated FAQs and instructions, right? So we've curated our own instruction guides to send to the patients, and then we'll check in with them. From there, you're notified as those results come in. So one thing, quick call out is checking in with the patient. Again, these are things that can sometimes be overlooked depending on your bandwidth. And, and again, it's a very manual process at times. So why don't we just leverage the technology that we already have created to check in your three patient? That's my dog in the background saying hi. So this is what those email communications will look like. Your patient will get an email as soon as you place that order. And this is an example of those communications, uh, assuming that the patient is the one paying for those tests. Mm -hmm. Hi, Joshua, Dr. Orton has ordered these tests for you. We'll introduce who we are. And then from there, we'll highlight the different payment options that we accept. So not only will we do cash and credit, but we can three month interest-free payment plan with the patient. From there, we'll collect all the necessary information to complete that order. Um, we'll collect, of course, the shipping information, the billing information, and then uh, if they do want to set up that payment plan with us, we can go ahead and do that directly with them. We'll highlight the test that was ordered for them, and then we'll outline all costs associated with those tests. Should you decide to pay for the test, then bill the patient outside of RUPA, nothing will change in terms of the patient experience. We're still going to manage that end-to-end -end patient experience but we're, we'll, we'll adjust those communications a little bit, right? Since you're the one paying for the tests, we're not gonna collect billing information from the patient. And additionally, we're not gonna show them the cost of what that test was. So, you know, if you wanna bake in, you know, interpretation fees, for example, I know that's something that a lot of practitioners prefer to do. Then you have that option here, right? You pay for the tests and then bill the patient separately outside of Rupa. From there, you're notified as the patient, or excuse me, once the order is shipped out, and then here's a copy of those communications that we'll send to the patient that outlines the instructions for each of the tests, um, how to fill out the requisition forms. And of course, if there's a blood draw, we can help coordinate that as well. So if your patient has any questions along the way, they can reach out to us and our team. The way that we can coordinate phlebotomies is one of two ways. We can either customize those instructions based off of your recommendation, um, or we can go ahead and send over the options based off of the lab that they're working with, each lab having their own directory of blood draw locations and options. We'll send that to the patient. But at the end of the day, if there is any questions, they can reach out to us. Even if it's, hey, I can't work with any of these blood draw options that were sent my way, we will work directly with the patient to send over additional options that have been vetted by us and our team to ensure that they are well taken care of. And if they want a mobile phlebotomy option, for example, we can help them with that. From there, we'll send those uh, phlebotomy instructions. Again, this is reiterating what I just mentioned, checking in with the patient. And then of course you're notified via email once those results are coming in. So the idea here being, an end-to-end -end experience, offloading a lot of that heavy lifting that can be involved with these lab tests off your shoulders onto ours um, and making sure that it's as fluid as possible, leaving you as much time to focus really on treating patients as opposed to the admin work that can be associated with these tests. So with that, I'm going to jump back to the main screen here, walk through a couple of just additional features. The lab test catalog, for example, is going to give you a high-level overview of all the tests that we work with, all the labs that we offer. Again, over 20 different tests, over 2,000 different, or over 20 labs, over 2,000 different tests that we offer. You can filter by sample type, phlebotomy required, you name it. So feel free to play around in there. Uh, Rupert University, this is where you guys are all currently at. Uh, but you'll see here that you know, not only are we going to give you a, an idea of what's upcoming, but we'll also record and upload any of these uh, live classes and upload them into this library here. So if you happen to not be able to make one, no problem there. We'll record that, we'll upload that within a few days and you're able to watch that after the fact. We of course, of course offer support so you're able to reach out to us and our team. Not only are we offering patient support but also practitioner support. You can adjust your settings. So not only is Rupa designed for solo practitioners but we can work with clinics as well. So you can invite your clinic staff to join. They'll have their own login and everybody will have access to whichever tools are necessary for them. And then lastly, support centers, what's new, things of that nature, right? So we do, of course, have a support center where you can hop in, 
get an idea of all the articles that have been written about our cool features or see how things work. Um, you know, we have Arupa Magazine, shout out to Dr. Anthony and, and the Rupa Root Cause um, podcast as well that we're, that, we're, that we're putting out. So Rupa Health is more than just a place where you can come and, and place your orders for functional medicine lab tests, right? We're a platform for functional medicine. So where you can not only just place your orders and have a better experience and better and more efficient operations for your business, but a place where you can actually come and learn more and, and build upon the foundation of functional medicine, which is something that's so important. Um, but with that, y'all, that, that is a high level overview of Rupa Health. I know I, I mentioned a lot of different things, but if you have any questions, don't hesitate to reach out. Again, my name is Adrian Martinez. Uh, my email is adrian, A-D-R-I-A-N, at rupahealth.com. If you're looking for a more personalized demonstration or have any questions, please don't hesitate to reach out. But I'll let you all go for the rest of your afternoon. Thanks again, and hope you have an amazing rest of your Wednesday.